Next slide. All right, Ann. Ann will introduce our speaker. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, as John mentioned earlier, we have a new speaker with us tonight, one we haven't had before, Charles Knight. He is currently the curator of military history at the North Carolina Museum of History. He's originally from Richmond and uh, interned at the, um, I lost that, Oh, he, he interned at the Richmond Museum of the Confederacy during high school. Sorry, there we go. He earned his bachelor's in U.S. history at Bridgewater College and interned at the New Market Battlefield Historical Park. He was also the curator at the General Douglas MacArthur Memorial in Norfolk and then the director of the Arizona Capitol Museum in Phoenix, Arizona. He's the author of numerous books and articles and is here with us tonight to um, give a presentation on his most recent book, um, Arlington to Appomattox, Robert E. Lee's Civil War, Day by Day, 1861 to 1865. Let's give a warm welcome to Mr. Charles Knight. All right, good evening, everybody. Thanks for having me. Thanks for the introduction. Uh, I can honestly say this is by far the largest uh, audience I've ever spoken to, and I got to meet uh, a good number of you beforehand. Uh, so thank you for having me. All right. Uh, like Ann said, uh, tonight I'm going to be speaking on my newest book, uh, From Arlington to Appomattox, Robert E. Lee's Civil War Day by Day. So we've got a lot of ground to cover. You know, if we're going to get through four years in, you know, 45 minutes to an hour, you know, we've got a, got a lot of ground to cover here. But uh, uh, now I'm just going to give you the highlights. Yeah, okay. Got to make sure I got the right slide up there. Uh, it, when we talk about General Lee, it's easy to get wrapped up on the idea of Lee being General Lee. You know, it's very easy to lose uh, lose sight of the fact that Lee was a human. You know, he he had emotions. You know, he he was a, apart from being the commander in chief. You know, he's a pretty normal guy. Um, and it's like I say, it's very easy to to focus on the military aspects of the man and and forget the human aspects of the man. Uh, during the uh, four years, 1861 to 1865, uh, it was very traumatic. I know that's a massive understatement. It was a you know it was a time of war, uh, but it's uh, it really crippled Lee in a lot of ways. Uh, the man's health would fail him. Uh, he loses several family members during that time period. His wife becomes wheelchair bound. Uh, he loses not just uh, his home, but his his backup home, if you will, as well. His, his uh, uh, he had uh, three plantations that uh, that were left to him. All three of well, two of them uh, he lost in some way, shape, or form, and he was he was left uh, financially in ruin at the end of the war. And uh, uh, it's if if you think about the human aspects of Lee, you can see how it affected a lot of his military decisions. But unfortunately, a lot of the uh, a lot of the military histories leave out the human aspects of Lee and just focus on the the strategic uh, decisions and the troop movement. So I want to kind of talk a little bit about some of those overlooked aspects of Lee, if you will. So if you're here expecting, you know, to hear about, uh, you know, Lee at uh, uh, on Seminary Ridge on July 3rd at the end of Pickett's Charge. Not going to have that tonight. Going to have some other uh, uh, other lesser known stuff. Uh, but before I get into that, I want to talk a little bit about well, who knew Lee? You know, where do we get this information about Lee from? Uh, I'm sure a lot of you know Lee never wrote his memoirs. Uh, you know, most of the uh, commanders on both sides uh, wrote their memoirs. Lee did not do that. Uh, he intended to, but uh, he died before it happened. Uh, General Gordon uh, from Georgia, uh, who's on the screen back here, uh, he wrote one of the greatest works of Civil War fiction that is known to man. Uh, most of his uh, most of his uh, reminiscences existed only in his mind. You know, he, he didn't let the uh, the truth get in the way of, of telling a good story. 
Uh, but uh, Gordon, like many folks uh, on the uh, uh, Confederate side, uh, really regretted the fact that Lee did not uh, leave his memoirs. Uh, so where else do we turn? If we can't get Lee's version of things himself, where, where do we go? Well, we can, of course, turn to his family, his wife, his children, uh, his brothers and sisters. Uh, but uh, if you really want to know about what's going on at Army headquarters, of course, you can, you can look at Longstreet, you can look at Jeb Stewart, you can look at Stonewall Jackson. But if you really want to know the in and out of what's going on at Army of Northern Virginia head, Army of Northern Virginia headquarters on a daily basis, you have to look at the men that comprised his staff. Uh, it was a very small group of men. Lee's staff was normally uh, only about uh, somewhere between five to seven guys. Uh, you know, McClellan had an enormous staff. You know, Lee didn't do that. Uh, he said very early on in the war, you know, I need a small staff. I need men that know what they are doing. I can't have folks that are here just as hangers on. I need men that are that are not going to be learning on the job. I need men that uh, that know what they're doing. And he he did a good job of picking his staff officers. One of them is right here. I just got new glasses, so I can't really read what's on the screen back there. I'm still getting used to these things. Uh, so excuse me while I turn around and remember what I have. Uh, Charles Marshall, he was uh, one of Lee's longest serving aides. He joined Lee in the uh, spring of 1862. He was with him all the way through Appomattox. In fact, it's Marshall that accompanies Lee to the McLean House at Appomattox. If you don't know Charles Marshall, either by name or by picture, I can guarantee you, you know some of his work. Lee's farewell order at Appomattox was not written by Lee. It was written by Charles Marshall. Uh, most of Lee's battle and campaign reports not written by Lee. Lee served as the, the editor, if you will. They were written by Charles Marshall. Uh, more on him in just a second. Uh, but when Lee died in October of 1870, his son, Custis Lee, asked, uh, asked Marshall if he would be willing to uh, contribute a memorial, uh, basically an essay, uh, about the, the life of Robert E. Lee. And Marshall, he was intrigued by the idea, but he didn't do it because he didn't think he had enough time uh, to to do his uh, his former boss justice, and uh, he certainly didn't think he had enough uh, uh, enough pages, enough uh, enough bandwidth, enough paper, if you will, to do him justice. Uh, so Marshall declined doing it. Uh, but like I say, it, it, he liked the idea, and uh, it convinced Marshall to uh, to write his uh, his own uh, history of the war later. And uh, this quote uh, behind me, the important part of that is the the tail end of that. Uh, I shall collect all that I can and write all that I know to be used by some future biographer. And that was true, not just of Marshall, but by just about everybody on Lee's staff. It, either it was a published memoir, a collection of letters, uh, speeches uh, that they gave to uh, uh, various veterans groups, the transcripts of which still exist today. All of these men, Marshall and the, the others that I'm going to talk about here in just a second, uh, give us a great glimpse into the wartime life of Robert E. Lee. This guy right here, Walter Taylor, he was with Lee the longest. Uh, he served with Lee from about the beginning of May all the way, or May of 61 rather, uh, all the way through Appomattox. Uh, nobody was closer to Lee during the war than this young man right here, Walter Taylor. He was a, a banker from Norfolk, Virginia. He was a VMI graduate. Uh, like I say, he would serve with Lee uh, just about the entire war, only missed out on the first uh, two or three weeks of it. Uh, and after the war, uh, Taylor really became kind of the keeper, if you will, of Lee. Uh, if you wanted to know something about Lee, he went to Walter Taylor, uh, one of his duties at headquarters. He was he was the numbers guy. He was he was a banker, so he was obviously good with numbers. Uh, when the various units would comprise their morning reports and their casualty returns after battles and everything, Taylor is the one that compiled them. So he pretty much knew uh, almost by memory what the strength of the Army in Northern Virginia was at various times. So if you're writing about uh, Lee or the Army after the war, you had to correspond with Taylor so you could get the numbers. Uh, and Taylor became very sought after after the war. And uh, eventually he was convinced to uh, to put down uh, his memories of the war in writing. Uh, he, uh, he wrote two books. The first one came out in 1877. Uh, was not a very personable thing. It's actually pretty dry and boring, to be perfectly honest with you. Uh, then uh, several uh, decades later, he came out with a second one called General Lee, His Campaigns in Virginia, that's more of a, a personal memoir, if you will. It has a lot more of the, the in-depth 
uh, glances into uh, into uh, into Lee's life and uh, Taylor's time with him. Uh, but perhaps more importantly than uh, both of his uh, published works were Taylor's letters. He was a fantastic letter writer. He was a very observant young man, uh, and he constantly uh, wrote back home to uh, the, the woman that would become his wife, uh, Betty Saunders. They became engaged during the war uh, and were married. More on that uh, later. Uh, but uh, he would send two, three letters a week home to, to Betty, keeping her informed of what's going on, and very detailed letters. Uh, great glimpse into what's going on at headquarters, especially when Taylor is the only one there with Lee. Only problem with this is when Betty got his letters, she would read them and throw them in the fireplace. And the, she continued doing this for the first year and a half of the war. And Taylor didn't know about it until uh, late spring, early summer of 1862. When he found out about it, he pleaded with her, please don't destroy my letters. I'm writing these uh, just as much for me as I am for you. This is the only place I'm, I'm recording my wartime experiences. Please don't destroy these. Uh, so after, after she got that note, uh, she, she hung on to them. She stopped destroying them from there on out. Uh, so unfortunately, uh, in a lot of cases early in the war, Taylor was the only one with Lee. And Lee for various reasons, did not write a lot about what he was doing on a day-by-day -day basis. Taylor did. And so there's a huge, you know, uh, uh, more than a year gap at the beginning of the war in Taylor's letters. But those that survive are fantastic sources. Taylor's not the only one on uh, Lee's staff uh, uh, the, that, uh, that wrote a memoir. Uh, Armistead Long, who was Lee's military secretary from the end of 1861 on up through uh, middle of 1863, uh, he wrote a very thick memoir after the war, came out in the 1880s, uh, very detailed, fills in a lot of the gaps that, uh, that exist in Taylor's letters. Uh, Fitz Lee, who was uh, uh, the general's nephew, uh, he wrote a biography of his uncle after the war. There's some interesting information in there, but Fitz made the mistake of getting into politics after the war, uh, and his main campaign platform was, hey, look at my last name, it's Lee. Did you know I'm related to the general? Uh, so that was pretty much his platform, and uh, that was one of the reasons why uh, why he wrote this uh, uh, the biography of his uncle was to to keep that connection fresh in the public mind. But there's a little bit of uh, family information in there. Lee's youngest son, Robert Jr., uh, he would serve in the uh, Rockbridge Artillery at the beginning of the war, then eventually became a staff officer later. Uh, he wrote his uh, Memories of His Father, published in the early 1900s. And the, one of the real strengths of his book, it's called Recollections and Letters. And it contains, anybody? Recollections and letters. And a lot of those, the, the originals of those letters don't exist anywhere. The only place that those letters exist is in uh, Rob's uh, memoir. Uh, we don't know what happened to the original. So it's a, it's a great source of information about his father. Told you we get back to Charles Marshall. Uh, Marshall, he's a lawyer. He's originally from Baltimore. He was a distant cousin of uh, all these families, the, the leading families of Virginia, they're all related by marriage. Uh, the Marshalls and the Lees were distant cousins. So they were, they were related, but you know, they, they weren't going to sit at, at Christmas dinner together, but uh, they, they were distantly related. But anyway, uh, Marshall, uh, he started writing his memoirs after the war, and he died before they were done. Uh, and they, the family knew about them. They just didn't really know what to do with them. And that was up until the uh, 1920s. There was a British general, a guy by the name of Frederick Maurice, who wrote a biography of Lee. It was very popular on both sides of the Atlantic. And one of the folks that read it, not surprisingly, was Marshall's, child, uh, Marshall's daughter. And uh, when she read it, uh, somehow or another, she got in touch with uh, Maurice, explained who she was, and said, oh, by the way, I have my father's memoirs. Would you like to see them? You know, that's the, that's a horrible thing for his, for a historian to hear after you've just published the book. You know, here's this great source that I wish I'd had. And so, you know, he, he finds out about this, you know, a year after the book comes out. But anyway, he, uh, uh, Marshall's daughter, sends uh, his, uh, or, or, uh, her father's memoirs to, to Maurice. He cobbles them together. Uh, Marshall had not written them chronologically for whatever reason. He did the first chunk of the war. He did Gettysburg. He did the last chunk of the war. So there were some sizable gaps in there. Uh, Maurice cobbled it together and it was published in the uh, late 1920s. Uh, it's a great, great source, especially when it comes to learning about how the uh, uh, Lee's farewell order at Appomattox was written. There's great detail about that. A few other members of Lee's staff, uh, Thomas Talcott, 
He was the son of uh, Lee's mentor, Andrew Talcott. Uh, when young Lieutenant Lee was fresh out of West Point, uh, I believe he was a colonel at that time, Colonel Talcott uh, took young Lieutenant Lee under his, uh, under his care and showed him the ropes of uh, being an engineer. So when the war broke out, Lee had the chance to return that favor. He took Talcott's son uh, under his wing and uh, Talcott would serve on Lee's staff for about two years, uh, 62 and 63 before he left the staff. Uh, the guy in the middle, uh, Giles Cook, he was one of the more traveled, if you will, staff officers in the Confederate Army. Uh, he served not just with Lee at the tail end of the war, but prior to that, uh, he served under uh, Bragg and Beauregard. Uh, he kept a diary uh, during the closing months of the war, starting at Petersburg all the way through Appomattox. That is a fantastic uh, resource for things that are going on uh, with Lee and at headquarters during the, the closing stages of the war. And then the other fellow on screen, my buddy, Charles Venable. Uh, he was, he's my favorite of uh, all of Lee's staff officers. Uh, I'm not really sure how they got connected because uh, Venable was serving, he was, uh, he was from Farmville, Virginia. He was actually born on the same uh, uh, estate where Joe Johnston was born. They were not related. The Johnstons sold that, uh, sold that estate to the Venable family. But anyway, uh, Venable, he was one of the most brilliant men of the latter half of the 19th century. He was a college professor. He was a mathematical genius. Uh, he also got into astronomy later. Uh, very, very well-known fella. He taught at UVA, uh, University of Georgia, University of South Carolina, among others. Uh, and he was serving as a staff officer at Vicksburg uh, when somehow or another Lee learned about him and appointed him to his staff. Venable's problem was he didn't really, he wasn't really blessed with tact, shall we say. Uh, if something came into his mind, it was coming out of his mouth before he had a chance to process it, think about whether it was something he really should say. And one thing that, uh, that you don't find in a lot of the Lee biographies, especially Freeman's Lee, Lee had a very bad temper. And usually the subject of his outburst <laughs> is Venable. Uh, it, that happens when you speak your mind to the commanding general. You know, it, it tends to rub the commanding general wrong sometimes. I'll give you a few examples of that uh, as we go on uh, throughout the evening here. Uh, there would be other staff officers that, uh, that come and go from Lee's staff as well. Uh, I'll talk about another one, a guy by the name of John Washington here in just a minute. But these are the, these are the main guys uh, that Lee would, that would be at, uh, around Lee at headquarters. Now, when we think of Lee, uh, most folks associate him as being the commander of the Army of Northern Virginia. Well, it's logical. It's the command that he held uh, throughout most of the war. It's the one that he had the most success with. Uh, but it was not the only command that he had during the war. Uh, he held several commands prior to taking command of the Army of Northern Virginia at the beginning of June of 1862. When he first resigns from the U.S. Army, he goes to Richmond and he becomes the commander of Virginia's armed forces. And he would hold that post for the first few months of the war. Uh, after that, he would go out into the mountains of what is now West Virginia. From there, he would go, uh, he would command the defenses of uh, southern part of South Carolina from uh, a little bit north of Charleston, all the way down to the northern part of Florida. So part of South Carolina, the Georgia coast, northern Florida coast uh, was, uh, was his command for a while. Uh, then he would uh, come back to Richmond to be Jefferson Davis's military advisor, and then he becomes commander of the Army of Northern Virginia. Now, perhaps the best service that he rendered the Confederacy was in the first few months of the war when he organized Virginia's military. He had to, to take militia. He had to take volunteers. Uh, he had all kinds of people. Uh, he had to whip this semi-organized group of, of well-meaning young men into an army, into an effective uh, fighting force. And uh, that was time consuming to say the least. Uh, he also had uh, politicians and well-to-do citizens coming in, uh, uh, requiring or requesting rather meetings with him, hoping to get themselves commissions or hoping to get a, a son or a brother out of military service or, or trying to uh, uh, get for themselves a, a lucrative military contract. Uh, he also had to meet with the politicians constantly, and uh, he also had to figure out how to defend Virginia. You know, the Potomac River was now the border between two hostile countries. It had never been fortified like that before. Uh, the fortifications that existed 
were along the eastern seaboard to, to keep the English or the French from attacking, you know, not to keep the northern states from invading across the Potomac River. So Lee had to figure out how to fortify and where to fortify uh, Virginia as well. And uh, for the first uh, couple of weeks of the war, he didn't have a staff at all. He was doing everything himself. It was, it was about uh, not quite two weeks before he got uh, some help. Uh, so he was doing a lot of things that a staff officer should have been doing in the terms of correspondence and, and orders. Um, his, his door was pretty much a, a revolving door with all the politicians and everybody that wanted favors coming in. Uh, he didn't find a lot of time to write during this time period, but when he did write, he would say, I am busy from before dawn until well after dinner time. You know, he was pulling, you know, 10, 12, 14 hour days, seven days a week. Uh, the man didn't have time to do anything. It was one of the most thankless jobs the man ever had. Uh, but he did find time to, to get out of the office, if you will, and to, to leave Richmond three times uh, during the uh, late spring and early summer of 1861. Uh, he goes down to Norfolk in uh, mid-May. Uh, then at the end of the month, he goes north to Manassas. Then a week later, he goes to Jamestown and Williamsburg and Yorktown on the uh, uh, peninsula. On all three of these visits to the field, he didn't like what he found. He didn't like the commanders, any, any one of those regions. He didn't like the way that, the, the, that he found the troops. He didn't think they had been drilled enough. Uh, there was a lack of, lack of instruction, lack of discipline, and uh, he didn't like the, uh, uh, the fortifications in any of those areas. So all three of these visits will result in a change of commanders. Uh, in Norfolk, we get rid of the uh, militia general, we get Benjamin Huger. And it wasn't really a change for the better. Uh, Manassas, uh, we get rid of Philip St. George Cook, or Cock, depending on how, he, how you want to pronounce his name. And we get Beauregard on the peninsula. We get rid of Richard Yule's brother, Benjamin, and we get John Magruder. Uh, Lee, in a lot of cases, did not know who these militia officers were that were holding these important commands. Uh, so he had to turn to men that he either knew personally uh, from the old army or men that he knew by reputation. He needed men that he could trust in these positions. Sometimes it worked out, sometimes it didn't. Uh, Beauregard was probably the best of those three decisions that he made. Come on, there we go. At the end of July of 61, uh, Lee is sent to the mountains of Western Virginia. Uh, what is now West Virginia uh, was not a strong, uh, you know, it was not a hotbed of, uh, of secessionists. Obviously, that's why we have the state of uh, West Virginia today. And uh, they were having some recruiting problems out there. Uh, most of the, the folks out there were either unionist in sentiment or wanted to be left alone. Uh, the, the commanders out in that part of the state were not all that great. And so Lee is sent out to Western Virginia to take command. And it winds up being probably the rainiest July and August in the history of Virginia. You know, dating back, you know, thousands of years, it probably never, ever rained that much. It even snowed in August in the mountains of West Virginia. Snow, August, think about it. Uh, while he's out there, he finds the weather to be his biggest enemy, more so than the Federals. Uh, one of his uh, staff officers, he only took two guys with him, by the way, Walter Taylor and the guy I'm about to tell you about, John Washington. Uh, Washington would write that out of the uh, uh, several weeks that they were out there that he was present for, it rained all but about five days. And uh, in one of his letters, he said, uh, it's either just stopped raining or getting ready to rain or it's pouring currently. So, you know, and you can't supply an army, you can't move an army, especially through the mountains when everything is turning to mud. And so his, his campaign out there really did not go well. Uh, by mid or by the second week of September, Lee finally thought he was uh, uh, gonna be able to launch an attack against the Federals at a place called Cheat Mountain. Uh, but his commanders were too green, his, his battle plan was too complicated. And so the, the battle just, it, straight up doesn't happen. The, the uh, Confederates never attacked. And so the next day, Lee was trying to salvage something out of his, out of his plan. And so he sends his aide, John Washington, out to go reconnoiter, send him up a ravine, see if you can get at the, uh, the federal line that way, see if it was a, a legitimate avenue of approach. Well, Washington is, is riding out there and uh, he gets ambushed by, uh, I believe it was the 7th Indiana. Uh, they saw him and the couple of couriers that were with him coming and uh, 
Washington never knew what hit him. You know, he was, he was dead before he hit the ground, had something like 11 or 12 bullets in him, never knew what, what, uh, what hit him. Um, but uh, Washington's death really hit Lee hard. The two of them were related. They were cousins. They, uh, they weren't close, but uh, they, they had known each other. Uh, they both grew up in Northern Virginia. And uh, Washington, he was probably the closest thing that Lee had to an actual friend during the war, you know, despite the fact, you know, that it's, you know, commander, commanding general and staff officer, you know, despite that, uh, I think the two of them really were friends in some way, shape, or form. Uh, Washington was an extremely religious fellow, so was Lee. In fact, Lee at one point said he was he was in awe of Washington's piety, and, uh, you know, the, I think the only other person you could say, that Lee could say that about would be Stonewall Jackson, just to try and give you an idea of the religious convictions of John Washington. I'd say he was on par with, uh, with Jackson. But uh, Washington, his death struck Lee hard. Uh, after all, it had been just the three of them, Lee, Taylor, and Washington out there in West Virginia. And oh, by the way, they were sharing one tent that was about the size of that table over there with the, with the uh, t-shirts on it. So they got to know each other probably a lot better than they wanted to during the weeks that they were out there. And uh, like I say, Lee's, Lee was affected very strongly by Washington's death. And uh, it's something that he never really recovered from. And I would argue that September 13th, 1861 is the day that the war actually hit home for Robert E. Lee. It wasn't when he resigned from the army. It wasn't when Arlington was seized by uh, Union troops. It wasn't, you know, the, the, the battle at Manassas or anything like that. It was when his friend and cousin, John Washington, was killed in battle. And uh, Lee wrote a very, very lengthy and extremely extremely emotional letter the next day to Washington's daughter. And I've read hundreds of Lee's letters. Uh, there's nothing that comes close emotion wise to the one that he wrote to Louisa Washington talking about uh, her father's death. Uh, and it, it, he covers a range of emotion. You know, he, he goes from, you know, sadness to despair to anger back to sin. I mean, he, he's emotionally all over the place. It's almost like you could see the, uh, uh, the water stains from teardrops on his letter. And uh, he, he never really got over Washington's death. He remained close uh, with Louisa for the rest of his life. And uh, he actually gave her uh, uh, her father's uh, last message that, uh, that he had sent uh, to Lee uh, just before he was killed. Lee hung on to that for the rest of the war. Uh, he, he lost a lot of stuff during the war, but he held on to that one message from Washington and gave it to, uh, uh, to Louisa afterwards. Anyway. After his time in Western Virginia, uh, as I said, he's sent down to the South Atlantic coast uh, to take command of uh, Charleston, Savannah area, Northern Georgia. And uh, while he's down there, uh, he visits his father's grave for the first and perhaps the only time. Uh, it's an interesting uh, relationship. Uh, Lee and his father were never close. Uh, Light Horse Harry Lee was, a, of course, a Revolutionary War hero, uh, but uh, he was forced to uh, to leave the family basically due to his uh, due to his debts, and also during the War of 1812. Uh, Light Horse Harry was was not in favor of war with uh, with England, a uh, sentiment that very nearly got him killed in Baltimore by an angry mob, and uh, his health failed him. And between his his unpopularity after that, uh, Light Horse Harry went down to the Caribbean, uh, hoping that uh, he could recover his health. And uh, when he could tell that the end was near, he he decided to sail back to Virginia and say his goodbyes to his family. He never got there. He made it as far as Georgia uh, before uh, before he died. And he would be buried on the estate of uh, Nathaniel Green, one of his uh, Revolutionary War compatriots. And so he was he's buried uh, right near the uh, Georgia Florida uh, border. And even though Lee had been stationed at Savannah, straight out of West Point, you know, not far at all from where his father's grave was. He never went and visited. He just he didn't seem to care really, and uh, it was almost an afterthought. Uh, he was coming back from uh, from Florida from an inspection visit. He was headed back to Savannah, and he decided to to stop off and see the uh, the Green family estate and visit his father's grave while he was there. And uh, it, his we don't know what day he was there. It was sometime in uh, first part of January of sixty two. Uh, but he didn't really have much to say about it. You think this would be an emotional thing, you know, finally visiting his father's grave for the first time. 
he spent most of the letter talking about Green's estate itself, the house and the grounds. He, he covered his father's uh, gravesite in about uh, two sentences there before he moved on to other things. Uh, so it was, again, it's interesting. You know, he was so touched by Washington's death, and you compare that with going and visiting his father's grave, and it's just, you know, the emotion just, it isn't there. I thought, thought that was an interesting uh, comparison to make. At the beginning of March of 62, uh, Lee is recalled to Richmond. He thought he was going to be Secretary of War. So did everybody else except for Jefferson Davis. Uh, Davis he was, uh, uh, he hadn't had good luck with his, uh, uh, with the uh, War Department uh, as far as the cabinet post. And uh, so they were, Congress had authorized a, a sitting army officer to hold that post. And just about everybody thought that that meant Lee, including Lee himself. And when he gets to Richmond, he finds out that's not what Davis has in mind for him. Uh, he's going to be this newly created post military advisor to the president. Well, if there's anybody that didn't want or didn't need a military advisor, it's Jefferson Davis. Davis is a West Pointer. He's a Mexican war veteran. He commanded the first Mississippi during the Mexican war. His father-in-law was uh, Zachary Taylor. He had been uh, secretary of war after the Mexican war. Davis, he didn't even want to be president. Davis wanted to be a general in the field. It was only his ego that made him accept the presidency. He wanted to be a commander in the field. He did not want to be in the Confederate White House. And so when Congress uh, kind of as this jab at him says, we don't like the way you're running a war. You need a military advisor, Mr. President. And uh, Lee got the post. And it, it's an awkward situation. Lee didn't know what his duties were. Davis didn't know what his duties were, uh, but they made it work. Uh, Lee and Davis became this great partnership that Lee knew how to get along with Davis. Most of the other commanders did not. Joe Johnston, uh -uh. Beauregard, no. Davis hated the two of them for different reasons, but uh, Lee knew how to work with Jefferson Davis. And that was part of the key to his success later in the war was the, this uh, time period that he worked uh, hand in glove with Davis. So for March, April, May, Lee is, is right there at, uh, at Davis's right hand, but eventually Davis grows to trust him enough that he gives Lee freer and freer reign. Eventually Lee is pretty much running the war effort uh, and he's dealing not just with things in Virginia, he's dealing with things back in his old department on the Southeast Atlantic coast, he's dealing with Savannah, He's dealing with New Orleans. He's dealing with Vicksburg and other things along the Mississippi. And again, it's another one of those thankless time periods of his career. He's completely invisible to the public. They have no idea what he's doing. In fact, one of the Richmond papers wrote an article that said, what is General Lee doing? Question mark. And the, the gist of the article was, we don't know what he's doing. But uh, he was really running the, uh, the war effort. He was the one moving the chess pieces on the board. And then when Johnston is wounded at the Battle of Seven Pines at the end of May, Davis puts Lee in temporary, temporary, mind you, command of the Army of Northern Virginia. The idea was that when Davis, or excuse me, when Johnston recovered, he would retake command of the Army of Northern Virginia. Never happened, again, because of the, the Lee-Davis uh, relationship. Now, Lee, he, uh, in his first time in command, he was not popular when he first took command. Uh, he had, was not viewed as a successful officer because of his uh, failed campaign in West Virginia. And one of the first things that he does when he takes command of Johnston's army, he tells the troops to entrench, to fortify their entire line east of Richmond. That was not what they wanted to be doing. They wanted to fight, not dig ditches. Uh, but they found out within about a month uh, this uh, this engineer fellow, Lee, he knew what he was doing. Uh, as we know, he, he turns McClellan back from the gates of Richmond, and then he takes the offensive, goes north to fight a new Union army under John Pope in Northern Virginia. Now, Lee, he respected McClellan. He respected George Meade. He liked Burnside. How can you not like old Ambrose Burnside? He was just one of those guys, you know, he's not the brightest, you know, bulb in the box, but he's just one of these guys you have to like. Lee hated Joe Hooker's guts. He thought the man was a jerk, uh, but he respected his military ability. Uh, he respected Grant's military ability. And then there's John Pope. Lee thought he was a war criminal. Uh, Lee, uh, in his own words, Lee called Pope a miscreant. Uh, he wanted him uh, suppressed, Was uh, were his instructions to Jackson to go suppress the miscreant Pope. 
Uh, so he could not have been happier when he defeats Pope at Second Manassas at the end of August of 1862. Uh, but that is uh, that's where Lee has his closest brush with death throughout the entire war is on the field at Second Manassas. Uh, when he arrives on the field, uh, he's at, at the head of Longstreet's uh, column, and he was very nearly captured on the march across the, uh, the, the Bull Run Mountains on the way there. He was, he was way out in advance of the rest of the troops. The Union Cavalry Patrol came up, saw him, but got scared and ran away, uh, not realizing that they were looking at, at Lee. Uh, but anyway, when he gets to the, uh, to the battlefield somewhere around Groveton, he goes out to reconnoiter himself. And this is very characteristic of Lee in the first half of the war. He wants to see the ground himself. He doesn't depend on his staff officers or his lieutenants. He is of the opinion, I can only make the plan if I see the ground myself. And it very nearly gets him killed here. Uh, Venable was the only one of the staff that recorded this for whatever reason. Uh, and uh, this is from Venable's uh, unpublished memoir at UVA. On reaching the field of Jackson's fight of the 28th, Lee ordered the staff to remain at the edge of the woods out of sight of the enemy while he went forward himself on foot to Jackson's skirmish line and made his own observation of the condition of things on Jackson's right. On his return to the edge of the woods, he swiftly remarked, a sharpshooter came near killing me just now. We saw how near it was as his cheek had been grazed by the bullet of the sharpshooter. So he had a red mark right across his cheek where the bullet had gone like that. So if he'd been, you know, two inches this way, yeah, he's going to have a bad day. If he's two inches this way, he hears a bullet go by his ear. So he was in just the right spot uh, to, to get that uh, uh, red mark right there. It was the closest brush he had with death. Not the only one, but it was definitely the closest one he had during the war. And uh, his luck runs out uh, two days later. Uh, he's somewhere down by uh, Bull Run itself. And the uh, something spooks traveler. None of, there's 13 different accounts of this. None of them agree on exactly what happened, but something spooked traveler and he either uh, knocked Lee down or, or uh, threw Lee off his back. We don't know whether he was sitting on the horse or standing beside it. But anyway, uh, there's some kind of incident with his horse traveler. And when Lee falls, falls backward, he puts his wrists out behind him like this to try and catch himself. Uh, he doesn't do a very good job of it. Breaks this wrist, sprains this wrist. So when the Army of Northern Virginia crosses the Potomac into Maryland on its, uh, eventually on its way to, uh, to Sharpsburg, <clears throat> excuse me, Lee is like this, both of his arms in slings. He can't, he can't move his arms. He can't use his hands. Uh, so he, is, uh, uh, he can't dress himself. He can't write. He can't even feed himself. He has to get other folks, uh, either the people that he's staying with or members of the staff, to, to do everything for him, including feeding him. So he was extremely helpless throughout uh, the Maryland campaign. He had just been able to, to remount a horse, I believe it was the, the day prior to the Battle of Sharpsburg. It was either the 15th or the 16th is the first time he was able to mount a horse. He couldn't, he couldn't hold the reins, the horse had to be led, but uh, he, he, was, uh, he was at least making some progress there. It wasn't until the end of October when he was finally able to regain the use of both hands. Uh, so that's something that you don't uh, don't see a lot about in the uh, Sharpsburg literature was Lee's physical condition and how truly physically helpless he was at the time. And oh, by the way, another thing that Douglas Freeman would not want you to know, because uh, it's very uncharacteristically Lee at Sharpsburg, uh, he ordered his staff to fire on their own men somewhere on the hills behind uh, Burnside's Bridge, somewhere on the extreme right. Uh, when uh, D.R. Jones's troops over there uh, collapsed, I believe it was uh, uh, Corse's brigade, or Kemper's brigade, rather, uh, when they broke, uh, Lee rode out to try and get them to rally. They wouldn't stop, even for Lee. So he turned to the handful of staff officers that he had with them, said, if they, don't, if they continue to keep running, if they don't stop, shoot them. The only time during the war he ever did that. After Sharpsburg, uh, he pulls the army back to uh, the lower Shenandoah Valley to, uh, to rest and uh, lick its wounds, so to speak. And while he's there, he learns of the death of one of his daughters, Annie. She, had, uh, uh, she and her mother had come down to, uh, to North Carolina. Uh, they had been left homeless uh, after leaving Arlington, and they were just kind of bouncing around from, uh, from one friend to, uh, to another friend, to a cousin, to whatever, wherever they could, wherever they could stay. And so they were staying in, uh, uh, outside of Warrenton, North Carolina. And all of a sudden, Annie fell sick. She fell ill. And uh, doctors couldn't do anything for her. Uh, it's thought today that she had uh, typhoid. 
and uh, she was in some pretty bad, uh, pretty bad uh, shape there for a few days before she died on October 20th of 1862. And Walter Taylor happened to be there at Lee's tent when he got the message from his wife that their daughter had died. Uh, and uh, Taylor, uh, this, if he had not been there, we wouldn't, uh, we wouldn't know what Lee's reaction was. So this is a great glimpse into one of the most personal losses that Lee suffers during the war. One morning, the mail was received and the private letters were distributed, but no one knew whether any home news had been received by the general. He summoned me to his, uh, to his presence to, uh, to know if there were any matters of uh, army routine. I really can't see that. I need new glasses. These are new glasses. Upon which his judgment and action were desired. The papers containing a few such cases were presented to him. He received and he reviewed and gave his orders in regard to them. I then left, but for some cause returned in a few minutes and with my unaccustomed freedom, entered his tent without announcement. When I was startled and shocked to see him overcome with grief, an open letter in his hands. That letter contained the sad intelligence of his daughter's death. He didn't even know she was ill. This was the first, uh, uh, first letter he had that had any indication there was anything at all wrong. And speaking of his wife, when she left Arlington, he wanted her to go to Raleigh to stay there. He figured that was going to be safely out of the way. She would be safe there. She didn't want to do it because she didn't know anybody there. Mary Lee was a very, very difficult person by just about every account. Uh, she was, in essence, a spoiled rich girl. Uh, she didn't, uh, uh, she didn't want to be told what to do. She was very stubborn. Lee continually battled that with her. And so instead of just going and settling down somewhere, be it Raleigh or Richmond or wherever, she led this nomadic lifestyle, just bouncing around from place to place. Basically, she would stay until she wore out her welcome and then be forced to move somewhere else. And a lot of times he wouldn't know where she was. And so that caused him a lot of grief. And then uh, she very frequently complained in her letters to him that he didn't write to her enough. And so this is one of his uh, replies in uh, addressing that. You forget how much writing, talking, and thinking I have to do when you complain of the interval between my letters. Uh, it was as if, you know, she didn't realize there was a war going on, and he was one of the, the major players in this. And uh, I forget exactly when it was. I think it was sometime during the winter of 63, 64. She was staying at, at, in Liberty, Virginia. It's what is now Bedford, Virginia. And... Uh, there was a, a small quartermaster post there uh, because railroad went through there, Southside Railroad, and she was drawing uh, rations, or excuse me, the Virginia and Tennessee Railroad. She was drawing rations from the quartermaster, from the Army quartermaster there. At the time, Lee had the Army on reduced rations because there wasn't enough food to go around. When he found out that she was feeding herself and the girls with Army rations, he was livid. It's one of the few times you can actually see him lose his temper with her in his letters. Anyway, at the beginning, I mentioned how Lee's health failed him. He has what's probably a heart attack at the end of March, 1863. The army is encamped uh, at Fredericksburg. Uh, Lee has been spending the winter, uh, as he usually did, uh, under canvas in, in his tent. He didn't, uh, he didn't go indoors uh, for his headquarters. Uh, Jackson had a nice indoor headquarters. Lee himself did not. And uh, he has, again, what's probably a heart attack, completely knocks him flat. He's, he's really lucky to have survived this. And uh, the, uh, the two surgeons that, uh, that treat him, you can see them there, Dr. Guild and Dr. Bemis, uh, they tell him straight up, you cannot, you are no longer the commanding general, sir. You, you have to worry with getting yourself well. Uh, general Jackson can run the army. You, sir, are on bed rest. They send him to this house right here, uh, Belvoir, and uh, he would be confined there uh, to, to an upstairs bedroom for about uh, two and a half weeks uh, in late March, early April of 63. Uh, Jackson was running the army. He brought no staff officers with him. Taylor would come over once or twice a day just to keep him informed of what was going on. But his the, the doctors were very concerned that he might not survive this illness. And uh, he never truly got over it. Uh, for in, in his letters home from this point on out, he constantly complains of his attack of the spring is how he put it. He always called it his attack of the spring and how he, he 
still didn't feel right. And when Lee is writing to his wife or his daughters, for him to admit that he doesn't feel well, the man has got to be on death's door. He very seldom told them that he didn't feel well. He, he was always, you know, very stoic in that regard. Uh, but he did complain uh, quite, quite frequently that he, that he was not well. It also changed the way that he, uh, that he was fighting the war. Up until this point, he wanted to see things himself. He went out into the field to go see the terrain himself. He doesn't do that too much after this. He starts depending on the staff and on his lieutenants, uh, uh, the, the corps commanders and the uh, 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 division commanders to do a lot of that themselves. So his kind of way of fighting changes as a result of this as well. Battle of Brandy Station, June of 63. Uh, Lee's headquarters is outside of Culpeper, and uh, he had just gone the day before to review Jeb Stewart's cavalry. Uh, he, he was very fond of Stewart. Stewart loved to put on a show. You know, there was, uh, Jeb Stewart was his own biggest fan. You know, if he, if he thought he was going to be written about in newspapers, my God, he's going to do it. And so he has this huge review of his cavalry division. Lee is there. Some of the other uh, uh, brass is there as well. And then the next day, Union Cavalry attacks Stewart. Stuart gets surprised. Uh, Stuart is, is on the verge of, of losing this battle. And uh, Lee is growing concerned. He can, he can definitely hear the fighting. He can probably see the smoke uh, a few miles distance from his headquarters there. Uh, so uh, as the, the fighting continues, uh, Lee gets concerned enough that he goes over to, to take a closer look and see what's going on. He picks up uh, Richard Yule and Robert Rhodes along the way. And they will go to this house. Excuse me. I keep pointing at the screen that y'all can't see. He goes to this house right here, uh, James Barber's house, uh, Beauregard, uh, named after General Beauregard, obviously. Uh, Barber is an officer on uh, Yule's staff, and the uh, three officers, Lee, Yule, and Rhodes, and some of their staff officers, go into the uh, upstairs of the house. It's on a commanding hill. They can see the. They have a good view of the terrain uh, around them. Now, a cavalry battle is not like an infantry battle. You know, an infantry battle, you know, it's pretty static. You know, the, the, the lines are, you know, even if the lines move, they're not going to move quickly. Cavalry battle, uh -uh. they're constantly uh, charging and countercharging each other. And so when they got there, this house, Beauregard, was very safely behind Confederate lines. There was no concern that they, were, that they might be overrun. Well, very quickly, they are in no man's land. The Confederate cavalry that was there is driven off. And here comes... A couple of regiments of Union cavalry rapidly approaching the house. Yule starts freaking out, starts turning over furniture, barricading the doors and everything, and suggests that they make the uh, the, the upstairs bedroom that they're in into an Alamo and you know fight it out to the last man. Uh, but before that happens, uh, Lee's uh, uh, other son, Rooney Lee, uh, he he was, uh, commanded one of Stewart's cavalry brigades. His troops ride across the field and push the Yankees back before they're able to get to Beauregard, but. Uh, now, whether or not Lee saw this, we don't know. There's no indication one way or the other. Rooney Lee is wounded making that uh, 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 counterattack. And uh, if Lee didn't see it happen, he knew about it within minutes because Rooney was, was carted past the, uh, the house on a stretcher headed back to Culpeper very soon thereafter. Uh, A.P. Hill's wife was actually his nurse. But anyway, uh, so Lee, he's a very interesting situation there. And that was probably one of the first times that he started to, to question Yule's fitness uh, for high command there. Uh, and, and yeah, that, that's another uh, command decision. Lee didn't really get too well on that one. Um, not a lot of folks know that after Gettysburg, Lee tried to resign. Uh, he, uh, he wrote this very lengthy letter to uh, Jefferson Davis uh, telling uh, Davis that uh, he, he didn't think he held the, the confidence of either the men in his army or the public at large, and also his health was failing him rapidly. So he, he was begging Davis to, to put somebody else in command of the army in Northern Virginia. Davis obviously didn't do it, and uh, uh, he retained Lee. And that fall, uh, this would be in uh, November, late November of 60, uh, 63, uh, when the Army in Northern Virginia is encamped outside of Orange, Virginia, Davis decides to come visit the Army. Morale was kind of sagging at this point. Davis thought if he could come out there and review the Army, make some speeches, he could kind of boost morale out there. Uh, now, Davis, when he visits, he stays in that house right there that you see in front of you, Bloomsbury. It's still there today. It's right beside the Orange Airport. I believe the Orange County Historical Society owns that. They open it up for tours every now and again. 
nice little place, would have been plenty of room for Lee in there. And in fact, Lee had offers from about a dozen people in and around Culpeper for him to, to uh, make uh, their home his, his headquarters for the winter. Did he do it? Of course not. He stays in his tent against his doctor's orders. He stays in his tent, which would have been right about there on the slope of that uh, mountain back there behind it. So for the whole time that, uh, that Davis is there, Davis is in this nice warm house. Uh, Lee uh, is, is in his tent, which by this point is the same tent that he got in 1861. He complained that it, it was leaking like a sieve at this point, uh, but he, he's still staying there un, under the tent. Every morning he has to go over and, and uh, pick up Davis and they, they ride around to go see the army, uh, but it rains the whole time that, uh, that Davis is there. So he never gets to review the troops. He never gets to give the speeches. He never gets to do anything that he planned. So uh, Davis's grand morale boosting visit really just becomes a, a, a meeting, a three-day meeting for him and Lee. A few weeks after that, Lee goes to Richmond to meet with Davis. Well, why didn't they just discuss whatever when he was there? Well, it's a good question. Uh, the strategic picture had changed considerably, and it had to do with Braxton Bragg and the Army of Tennessee. Bragg had given up or been driven away from Chattanooga, and Davis wanted to send Lee out there to take command of the Army of Tennessee to replace Bragg. Lee did not want to go, but he didn't think he had a choice. In fact, he told Jeb Stewart as he was on his way to the, uh, to the train station in Orange, uh, I'm not coming back. Uh, good luck to you, basically, is what the message amounted to. And so uh, Lee Davis, the Secretary of War, and eventually Bragg joins them, are in uh, behind closed doors for days, several days, better part of a week in Richmond. And Lee works his magic he convinces Davis not to send him to replace Bragg. And not only does Lee change Davis's mind, which is not an easy thing to do, he convinces him to appoint Joe Johnston instead. Davis hates Joe Johnston. <laughs> and yet somehow Lee convinced him to put Johnston out there in Tennessee to replace Bragg. And uh, because Christmas is drawing close at this point, uh, Mary and, the, and most of the girls are in Richmond at this point. She's finally settled down. They're living on a house in, uh, on uh, Franklin Street, a couple blocks from the Capitol. Uh, the staff and everybody else expected Lee to spend Christmas there in Richmond with his family. Does he do it? Of course not. He goes back to Orange to stay in a leaky tent with Walter Taylor, Charles Marshall, and Charles Venable. And uh, as soon as he gets there, he finds out that he should not have left uh, because... Uh, his uh, daughter-in-law, this would be Rooney's wife, Charlotte, uh, dies day after Christmas. Uh, she had fallen ill while he was there, and uh, he, like everybody else, thought she was going to improve. By the time he got to Orange and found out that uh, it was going downhill quickly, he didn't have enough time to get back to Richmond before she expired. And uh, this would not be the, uh, the only death that, uh, that happens to Lee during the war. Uh, I've already mentioned Annie, uh, Charlotte and Rooney's uh, children. Both of them die during the war. Uh, one died during the Seven Days Campaign. The other died uh, not long before this. It's thought that uh, uh, Charlotte died of complications from her pregnancy. And oh, by the way, her husband Rooney is not there. He's in a Yankee prison camp when this happens. Uh, he found out about his wife's death in a letter from his sister, and uh, uh, he was not even able to visit her grave until uh, March of 60, uh, 64 when he was exchanged. And uh, still not the only death that, uh, that happens to Lee. He also loses his sister during the war as well. Um, a lot of tragedy strikes the Lee family, especially Rooney's family. Rooney loses both his kids and his wife and his house. Skipping ahead a bit here to the Overland campaign. This would be late May of 64. Lee has another close uh, brush with death here at this house, a uh, place called Ellington. It was the uh, residence of the Fox family. Um, Lee, had uh, he's pulled his army back behind the North Anna River. Uh, he can see Yankees on the other side of the river approaching him, but the, the Fox house here has a, a great vantage point uh, looking out at both his troops and the approaching Yankee troops. He's, he's out in front of the house here, and uh, Mr. Fox looks out the window, sees his group of officers, recognizes who, who one of them is, comes outside, and uh, says, oh, General Lee, my family and I would, would be honored if you would come in and, and have uh, lunch with us. Lee says, oh, no, we won't be here that long. 
uh, but he can very quickly see that he's hurt Mr. Fox's feelings. And uh, he says uh, uh, very quickly, but uh, I, if, if you have some buttermilk, my officers and I would love some buttermilk. So Fox is uh, just a minute, sir. He runs in the house, comes back out a minute later with a, a tray with a pitcher of buttermilk and a few glasses on it. And uh, Lee is pouring himself, he's up on the porch at this point. He's up on the uh, porch there pouring himself a, a nice glass of buttermilk. Meanwhile, Union artillery across the river has seen this grouping of officers over here. They start firing a couple shells downrange. One of them passes within a couple of feet of Lee, smashes right into the door frame right beside him. Uh, it was either a solid shot or a dud because it didn't explode, but that was his cue to leave. So he, uh, he took his leave at that point. And uh, this is one of those things I can't prove, but there's enough dots here to connect I think Lee got food poisoning from this. I think that buttermilk was spoiled because that afternoon he's complaining of horrible, horrible abdominal pain, so much so that he has to ride around in an ambulance. And couple this with the uh, just his, his growing infirmity, whatever it was, and uh, his lack of sleep. He had only been getting about three or four hours of sleep a night uh, ever since the wilderness. Uh, his, his condition rapidly deteriorates. He's confined to his tent. Uh, within about 36 hours of this, and he's out of action for about a week and a half, two weeks. The Army of Northern Virginia is left leaderless, and this is one of those times where Charles Venable makes a mistake of opening his mouth and telling Lee what he thinks. Uh, Lee is in his cot, you know, moaning, rolling around on, uh, in agony here, and Venable just tells him, you know, look, you need to send to Richmond and get him to send Beauregard or anybody up here to take command of the Army. You're in no shape to command this Army. That's not what Lee wanted to hear. And he let Venable know that. And uh, he didn't speak to Venable for about a day or two after that. Uh, and that, that was pretty common for the two of them to have it out with each other and to just, and just not speak to each other for a day or two. Uh, but anyway, uh, I'm running out of time here, so I'm going to skip that one and move ahead here uh, to Petersburg. Uh, Lee has three headquarters in Petersburg. Uh, the first one is a place called Violet Bank, right overlooking the Appomattox River. Uh, then he has this place here called the Beasley House, and then he moves to another place called Edge Hill, the uh, uh, William Turnbull House. Uh, he had to give up Violet Bank because when the, uh, uh, when the leaves fell off the trees in the autumn of 64, it was in plain view of enemy artillery. So he couldn't stay there when Yankee artillery could drop shells into his tent whenever they felt like it. Uh, so he tells uh, Walter Taylor, go into town, find us someplace safe. So Taylor goes into Petersburg, he's riding around, and he comes across this house. It's empty, but it's furnished, but there doesn't appear to be anybody living there. It's got a nice, spacious yard around it. Even though it's in town, it's one of the few houses that actually has some, some acreage, well, not acreage, but a uh, you know, vacant lot to either side of it. The, the church that Lee goes to is diagonally across the street. Taylor thinks he's hit a home run here, finding this place. So he gets everything set up. He has, you know, he's, he's got everything there. Every uh, headquarters is all set up with everything except for Lee. And then uh, all of a sudden this uh, uh, civilian rides up out front and says, what are you doing in my house? And uh, Taylor explains uh, who he is. And, you know, this, uh, General Lee has taken this house as his headquarters. And the guy looks at him like, no, I don't think so. And he explains to Taylor, uh, my new wife and I just rented this house for our honeymoon. Get out. And uh, Taylor explains, well, I'd like to, but no. And so for the next uh, three and a half weeks or so, uh, while, uh, while the uh, house is serving as Lee's headquarters, this guy is just out front, you know, kind of you know, kind of doing this number, uh, or, you know, and, and finally Lee goes to Richmond and the, the guy realizes, you know, this is his chance to pounce. Unfortunately, we don't know who this guy is. None of the accounts put a name to this guy. I'd, I'd love to know who he was to do some research on him, but we don't know who he was. Uh, but finally, when Lee is gone, uh, this fella comes up, tells Taylor, all right, get out of my house. And so Taylor has to leave, they pack everything up and they move to another place, Edge Hill on the uh, Western outskirts of town. And uh, Lee doesn't know about this. Taylor gets everything set up. And uh, I think it was Marshall went to go meet uh, Lee at the, uh, the train station when he comes back from Richmond. And uh, he's explaining uh, to Lee, oh, sir, you, you'll love our new headquarters. New headquarters, what are you talking about? And Marshall explains why they had to move. Lee got quite a chuckle out of that. It's interesting to read his letter to Mary where he explains this. But uh, Taylor uh, had an interesting version of this that he wrote uh, to Betty that's, that's worth reading. 
if I can see that far. The only house available, you know what? I'm going to do it this way. Just excuse me while I turn around. The only house available was one some two miles from town. So bag and baggage, we came to Edge Hill. And what did I just do? And here I am finally fixed in the parlor with piano, sofas, lounges, pictures, rocking chair, etc. Everything as fine as possible for a winter campaign. After fixing the general and the rest of the staff, I concluded I would have to occupy one of the miserable little back rooms of the house. But Mr. Turnbull told me that I should take the parlor, and this decided me. I believe Lee was pleased with his room, and on entering mine, remarked, ah, you're finally fixed, but couldn't you find any other room? No, but this will do. I can make myself tolerably comfortable here. Lee was stuck dumb with amazement at my impudence and soon vanished. And Lee left things as they were. He spent the entire winter in one of the smaller uh, bedrooms, and Taylor got the, the master parlor all to himself all for the uh, uh, for the winter of 64, 65. And uh, one interesting account that, uh, that Lee added in his description of this that Taylor did not, uh, Lee complained to Mary that his room, the door didn't close all the way. And so at night, all of Turnbull's cats and dogs came into his room because it was the only room they could get into that had a fireplace. And so I just have this vision of Lee throughout, you know, while he's making all these decisions about Petersburg, you know, just with all these animals surrounding him. April 2nd, 1865. Today, a hundred and however many years ago that was. Uh, a, Lee has a few problems on uh, April 2nd. Uh, he and Longstreet and A.P. Hill are there in the, uh, in the Turnbull house, probably in that room, you know, with the door didn't close, uh, discussing when and how they're going to withdraw from Petersburg. And uh, while they're discussing this, Marshall bursts into the room and tells him, sir, General Hill's lines are broken. We can see Yankees across the field there. Hill doesn't need to hear anything else. He runs out of the room, gets on his horse, rides down the road, gets himself killed. Uh, meanwhile, Lee is trying to figure out what's going on. The sun has starting to come up by this point. They can actually see troops across the field. And uh, according to the staff, they're not friendly. And uh, uh, so, Lee tells Taylor, all right, pack everything up. It's time to go. So Taylor's trying to get headquarters packed up and uh, a artillery battery, Confederate artillery battery uh, drops trail right there in the front yard of the house. They meant well, they were trying to defend Lee, but all they did was just draw attention and subsequently draw fire on the house. Uh, the house, as you can see from the sketch, did not survive. Uh, they managed to get everything out of there, but uh, shortly after uh, headquarters was evacuated, the house burned to the ground. Uh, while all this is going on, Lee finds out that his daughter, Agnes, is in Petersburg. She had come down a couple of days previous to visit her father, but because of uh, uh, Lee trying to plan how to get out of town and, and Sheridan at, at Five Forks and Dinwiddie Courthouse and everything, Lee was never able to connect up with her. He thought she went home to Richmond. She did not. She was still staying in Petersburg. When Lee finds out about that, he takes off the general hat, puts on the father hat, turns to the closest cavalryman he can find, says, go find my daughter, get her out of here. Uh, he manages to find her in, uh, in downtown Petersburg, uh, despite all the fighting that's going on. Uh, they get on the, the very last train that's headed uh, back to Richmond from Petersburg, and they get to Richmond just in time for the evacuation fire, which comes within about a block of the Lee house. She was probably safer in Petersburg, but it seemed like a good idea at the time. Uh, Lee was in a vile mood, which is completely understandable considering everything that's going on. Lee was in a vile mood on April 2nd. Uh, he was snapping at anybody and everybody that crossed his path. Uh, uh, he inherited several of AP Hill staff officers who didn't know him well enough to stay away from him when he's in a mood like that. So he bit the head off of uh, uh, Hill's chief of staff at one point. Uh, and uh, eventually, Taylor gets up the courage uh, that evening after the, the fighting had died out. Uh, Taylor goes up to him and uh, says, General, uh, can I go to Richmond tonight? Uh, Betty and I would like to get married. Uh, I can only imagine how Lee received this <laughs> request considering his mood. Uh, but uh, surprisingly, he agreed to it. And he, he tells Taylor, yes, you, you can go, but be back first thing in the morning. So while Richmond is literally burning around him, uh, Taylor and Betty Saunders would uh, would be married. And uh, Taylor, true to his word, comes back uh, the next day and meets the army in Chesterfield County somewhere. And when Lee leaves Petersburg, that's a march that uh, takes him and the army to Appomattox Courthouse. And of course, the surrender on April 9th. 
Uh, Lee would stay there three days after meeting with Grant and all the accounts from the staff officers just say it was like a huge weight had been lifted off his shoulders. Uh, on April 9th, you want to stay out of his way because he wasn't happy about having to surrender. But on April 10th, he was just completely relaxed, according to the, to the, uh, his staff officers. You know, they were uh, former uh, compatriots from the old army were coming over to, to, to visit with him. George Meade was probably the most prominent uh, Union officer to, to cross over the lines to visit with Lee there at Appomattox. Uh, on April 12th, uh, in the late morning, he finally leaves Appomattox, headed back for Richmond. Uh, the, uh, most of the staff goes with him. Venable was the first to peel off. He lived in uh, uh, Farmville, so he didn't travel with him very far, but the rest of them stayed with him all the way to Richmond. Uh, he visits his uh, his brother on the way through uh, Powhatan County, and uh, Lee and, and his party would cross over the James River into Richmond and pouring down rain that day. Uh, they crossed on the Yankee pontoon bridge. Word of his arrival had, had spread. And so everybody was turning out to see him. Civilians, military, men, women, black, white, everybody wanted a glimpse of him as he uh, crossed over and uh, headed up the hill to, his, uh, to the house on Franklin Street. And uh, nobody talked to him for the most part. Uh, they just wanted to see him. Uh, but uh, when he got there uh, to Franklin Street, he was finally reunited with Mary and the girls. Uh, he would stay there for a few more weeks that summer. He and uh, the family would move uh, to Powhatan County, a little place called Derwent. And it's while they are staying there that he gets a letter from a little college in Lexington, Virginia, Washington College, offering him the presidency of that school. He accepted and he would serve the rest of his life as president of Washington College. And one question that invariably comes up is even though Lee was not a very easy person to get along with, uh, how did how did these young men that uh, that were on his staff, how did they feel about him after the war? Uh, the best answer that I can give that question, when Taylor and Betty had a son, they named it Robert E. Lee Taylor. And in fact, at uh, Lee's funeral, uh, Mary and the rest of the uh, family invited uh, the three staff officers, Taylor, Venable, and Marshall, to sit in the front pew with the family there at his funeral. Uh, so there we had to we had to skip over a few days of the four years of of the war there in terms of uh, in terms of time, but uh, I thank you for being here and hopefully you've learned a few things about Lee. Hello. Hello. Oh, there we there go. You go. Now we have a working. Uh, now we have uh, our Q&A session. We do have the mic up here. We already have a question working. Uh, we asked you to come up and go here. Uh, if you cannot make it up to the mic, raise your hand and I will bring this mic over to you. But we have one all ready to go. Thank you. I think I know the answer to this, but I'll ask anyway. How did Longstreet and Lee feel about each other after the Appomattox? After the war? Yeah. That's a complicated question. <laughs> <laughs> Depends on when we're talking about. Uh, of course, you know, uh, Lee only lives for about uh, five years after the war. So, you know, the, the worst of Longstreet's transgressions, if you will, were, were uh, uh, thankfully Lee didn't get to see them. Uh, but the uh, they never saw each other personally after Appomattox. I'm not, I know they did remain in contact. How close contact? I don't know. I think part of that was just because of the distance involved, you know, with Longstreet uh, living in Georgia. Lee remained in close contact with just about all of his lieutenants, especially those that were in Virginia. But I, again, I think it's just the distance factor is why he was not in as close a contact with, with Longstreet. I don't have a good answer for you, <laughs> to be honest. That's a good question. Yes. Uh, thank you for an excellent presentation. Uh, I have a question about a, uh, an aspect of Lee that I don't hear discussed very much. Uh, Lee made a choice and, and choices have consequences. He committed treason against the United States. Was his execution contemplated and should have it been? 
and I'm, I'm understanding that Johnson uh, probably would have pardoned him anyway, but was that ever taken into consideration? Execution, no. He was, there was a fear of him being imprisoned as there was with most of the high ranking Confederates, politicians and military. Um, in fact, there was an order that came down right after Lincoln's assassination. Lee had just arrived back in Richmond. Orders came from Washington. I forget the exact wording, but it was basically arrest every Confederate official you can find in Richmond. And uh, Edward Ord, who was the uh, commander in Richmond, the Union commander in Richmond at that time, uh, he told him uh, point blank, if I arrest Lee, the war will break out again. Um, so there was some fear that he could be arrested. Um, he did not do like early in Breckenridge and some of the others and flee the country. Uh, but here again, I, I don't know. I've never looked at things from the other point of view. I don't know how seriously charges were, you know, considered against Lee. So here again, it's another one I don't have a good answer for, in all honesty. Uh, you spoke about uh, Lee almost getting killed and coming back and well, maybe almost bragging about, hey, I almost got killed out there. <laughs> um, back in the Mexican War, he was doing a lot of reconnoitering before, uh, during that war. Right. Uh, he was one of the leaders going out there and, and finding things out. Right. Uh, and this may have dragged on into the Civil War. Did he continue on doing this, getting the lay of the land yes. after his little exercise? Very much so, yeah. Um, yeah, he was uh, He was pretty much the, the eyes, not so much the ears, but definitely the eyes of Winfield Scott's army down there. He and Beauregard, in fact, a, a rivalry developed between Lee and Beauregard and, uh, as to which one was going to be the uh, the better uh, scout, engineer, whatever, so to speak, down there. Uh, but uh, yeah, that that was that was why Lee, you know, was the way he was. You know, he, he was an engineer's training, you know, an engineer, you know, can't make plans without seeing the ground. And he uh, brought an engineer's mindset to Army Command. You know, I, I can't make plans if I don't see the terrain. And especially in West Virginia, he was constantly out there in the field. He usually took Taylor with him when they were in the uh, West Virginia campaign there in late 61. And then uh, as well as uh, down the South Atlantic coast, you know, he wanted to see the terrain that he was charged with defending. And once he gets the A and V, it's the same thing up until his heart attack. You know, the, the example there at second Manassas is, is the prime example of it, you know, going out there, you know, I, I can't make a plan to attack them if I don't know where they are. Uh, type of deal. And it, it very nearly got him killed there, very nearly got him captured the day before that. Uh, but yeah, once uh, once his heart attack happened, he really had to cut back on that. But he he brought it back at Petersburg out of necessity. Uh, but yeah, at Gettysburg, part of it was his health. But at Gettysburg, he, he wasn't out and about uh, and, you know, up until really the army gets to Petersburg. He's not out there doing that stuff anymore. But yeah, you're exactly right. <laughs> now look what you did <laughs> ruining the special effects um i wanted to uh ask you about a, a particular incident a personal incident about lee and it comes from uh one of my ancestors um uh, john sergeant wise <laughs> who wrote um the end of an era mm -hmm. and um on on that escape run after petersburg fell leaving Richmond, heading west to Appomattox. Uh, and it's right after Sailor's Creek. My other ancestor, his father, Henry Alexander Wise, had arrived that day and went into Lee's tent. And my ancestor was there. And that's why <clears throat> in his book, he talks about this scene where Lee walks up to my uh, Henry Alexander Wise and says, um, what do you think of the situation? <laughs> and he's looking for answers, it seems. You know, what should I do? Should I, should we surrender the army? And um, 
my ancestor, who was another kind of outspoken individual because they were related by marriage, um, says, what situation? There is no situation. And he says, well, what will the country say if I surrender? And he says, there is no country. You've been the country for the last couple of weeks or months. And I was wondering, are there any other descriptions of that encounter by any other writer? Yeah, I know the exact scene you're talking about. Yeah, it's uh, uh, yeah, Lee and Wise had an interesting relationship. I'm, I'm glad you brought that up. Uh, uh, Lee first encountered Wise in uh, West Virginia in uh, uh, the fall of '61 and didn't quite know what to do with him. <laughs> so it's uh, it's interesting that they uh, were reunited there, so to speak, at the end of the war. But uh, yeah, that was one of Lee's characteristics. Uh, whenever he I don't know exactly how to phrase it, but uh, he was constantly asking officers, you know, be it, you know, a lieutenant general all the way down to, you know, a lieutenant that just happened to be visiting. He, it was just part of his nature, you know, to ask them what they thought of the situation. He, he would do that constantly. I've run across that uh, quite often, you know, where there would be staff officers, you know, that delivered an order and he had them stay around for, you know, a meal or whatever. He would ask them what they thought about that. But uh, yeah, the the incident that you're uh, referencing, yeah, his uh, wise was exactly right. You know, everybody with Jefferson Davis knew the war was over by after uh, Lincoln was reelected, and uh, like likewise said, you know, Lee really was the country is the way he put it. You know, the um, yeah, you know, as Lee went, you know, so would the 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 South basically is what that amounted to. Um, so yeah, it was interesting thing, but uh, um, I've gotten sidetracked. What was the question? <laughs> I, was asking, I was asking if there were any other descriptions of that encounter. Oh, uh, yeah, right. Um, I don't remember any. The only one I remember is from John Wise in, in uh, End of an Era. Yeah, um, but yeah, it was, it was interesting, that encounter between uh, Wise and Lee, because it was around that same time, uh, uh, it was right after Johnson's division had been destroyed at uh, uh, Sailor's Creek and, and Lee put Wise in charge of what was left of it. Yes. Yeah, Wise was an interesting fellow. Yeah. He, he became a general, but he had no military service. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> that was a, a favor mm -hmm. from Robert Lee. Mm -hmm. um, that, I've read that book three or four times. It's just, um, it just brings it down to personal. And it's also the what happens to uh, my ancestors' family. See that here. Mm -hmm. It's an excellent book. You know that. <laughs> you mentioned the general order at Appomattox and it sounded like you wanted to get back to it. I'm sorry, say again. Uh, you mentioned this general order at Appomattox and it sounded like you wanted to get back oh, to yes, it. Oh, yes, 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 yes. Um, uh, Lee had, uh, uh, he wanted a, a farewell order of some description written to the army. And, uh, he told, uh, Marshall to do it, um, pretty much as soon as he got back from the McLean house. And then the morning of the 10th, he asked, uh, Marshall if he had done it yet. And, uh, Marshall said no. So he, uh, Lee basically, uh, you know, locked him in a wagon and said, here, don't come out of there until you've got the, until you've got my farewell order written. And uh, Marshall wrote the whole thing himself. You know, he came out, I think Lee only had, you know, minor corrections. I think he crossed out like two or three words or something that he didn't want. So it was 99, you know, 98, 99% of uh, uh, Charles Marshall creation that Lee approved of. But yeah. I one last question or two. We got two. Uh, thanks for the presentation tonight. No, I've read the book. I love the weather reports every day. Oh, <laughs> that was a nice little touch. I wish um, I had more. <laughs> the other thing I would say to the people here, having read the book, it's really a neat little reference book to compare as you read other authors and how they're describing what's going on in a particular battle. Uh, I'm right now, I just finished uh, comparisons and command and looking at seven pines and, and looking at those five days right before that happens and what's going on in Lee's life right before that. And, and mm -hmm. he's there on the battlefield and you, 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 you summarize it in a paragraph basically, mm -hmm. but, but it's good to see how he is reacting to things that were going on 
that are being written in detail elsewhere. But it's a great book to compare against other books, books that are out there right now. Thank you. Appreciate that. I've still got three copies up here. <laughs> there you go. Hey, just a quick uh, understanding on what was Lee's opinion of what happened to Gettysburg afterwards? What is, did he feel that he was at fault or did he feel that the generals under him didn't do their positions properly? I'm guessing you mean, did he blame Ewell and Stewart? <laughs> he did not. No, he, uh, he admitted the, uh, uh, the, or he took the blame rather for it. He didn't find anything at, at fault, especially with Ewell. Um, Ewell, you know, Lee's orders were take it if practicable. Ewell didn't find it practicable. Lee was fine with that. Uh, you know, it, I'm sure he probably, you know, in hindsight would have said, I, I wish he'd done it, but it wasn't even feasible. Lee or uh, Ewell rather didn't have any fresh troops to go up there and, and take the, uh, take Colts Hill or Cemetery Hill uh, on the first anyway. But um, he was irritated with Stuart. Um, did he blame him for the battle? No. No, and despite what uh, despite what you hear about the the famous meeting of uh, Lee Pickett and Mosby after the war, you know where you know Pickett supposedly says that old man destroyed my division, didn't happen. That was made up. But uh, but Lee did uh, Lee did take the blame for it on the third, and he he did resign or tried to resign anyway. So I think that's the, that's the ultimate sign of taking responsibility for it there. So. I thank you for your presentation. It was really great. Thank you. Um, I recently ran across a man by the name of Stan Waddy, who was close to General Lee. Have you ever come across? I think what was the Cherokee? name? Cherokee. Stan Waddy. Oh, the uh, Cherokee general? Yeah. Do, uh, do you, have, you shed any light about him? A Cherokee man told me about yeah. I don't know anything about. He served out west. That's about all I know about. In the Appalachians or for no, way west, <laughs> Trans Mississippi west. Oh, okay. All right. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. 